You know, the other day I was I, I dropped my glasses and stepped on them, oh. and, uh, it, and and I even stopped, but but it did damage so quickly. It's even a little bit of weight ruined those things. So now I have these from the drugstore, and they work all right. And thankfully so i may be using them tonight as we continue our reading in genesis chapter 21 last week we we began the chapter and we saw that it started with the promise fulfilled the birth of isaac god had promised and god is is good to his promise and uh, we observed that how god performed it and we saw how abraham responded to the promise and how sarah reacted and how isaac was rewarded as he grew and uh, he weaned and had the feast and it, we looked at all the spiritual applications of that and then we looked at no sooner did did the promise come and Isaac being a type of the Lord Jesus Christ and no sooner than we get Christ then all of a sudden the tests come <laughs> and right away you get a test from the family uh, immediately uh, verse 9 Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian which she had born unto Abraham mocking and we talked about that last week as as we looked at the life of Abraham and we saw that all through his life he was always battling with his family. I mean, back in chapter 11, his father was battling with him, probably prevented him from getting to the promised land for a while as they waited in Haran. And then uh, his nephew Lot <laughs> fought with him for a while. And then there was the battle and the problem with uh, Sarah, his wife. Oh, she's my sister. She's my... And all the problems going on there. And now we have one of the children and, and we saw that and probably the hardest place to live for Christ is right in the family, right in the home. I mean, no sooner you get saved than it's coming from every which direction. Mom, dad, the brothers, the sisters, the nephews, the kids, everybody. And so these are the tests that come in the Christian life. And, and God you know, wants to work with us in a real way. He wants to make a change with us right under the microscope of family life. I mean, folks knew us before we were saved. They knew what we were like. I mean, what a testimony. You know, when God saves an individual he makes a great splash into a family yeah. i mean it, it's a big splash in a family a light goes on in that family because that family has known the individual they've known the nuances and the problems and the faults and the foibles of the individual and and now god gets in there and does the work and there's light and some members of the family love darkness rather than light and the battles begin and so we see this happening in abraham's life now we saw the battle. We saw the son uh, of Hagar, uh, this would be Ishmael, mocking Isaac. And the Lord, uh, through Sarah, and then confirmed it, said, cast out the bondwoman and the son, because not going to be heir to the promise. I mean, God reiterates over and over and over that this is the God of Abraham and Isaac. He is not the God of Abraham and Ishmael. He's the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And God made those choices and... and all we can do is give him glory and praise him that he did. Now, we read through the story last week, and we started to look at it. And, and today I wanted to look at three applications of that particular test, as the test became Ishmael battling against um, Isaac. The test in the family is now we have the birth of Isaac, and now we have Ishmael, and he's mocking And, and this test was taken care of historically at that time. But as we look through it, we find applications that occur. And, and we'll look at an historical application first, and then we'll look at a doctrinal and a spiritual. We we'll want to look at all these. So, so what is this going on here with this Isaac and Ishmael thing? Well, let's look at it from a historical standpoint. From a historical standpoint. What is this mocking that's going on here? What exactly is, is mocking? Well, well, mocking is something that you find in the Bible. Um, let, let me just see. Now, to mock, according to, to Webster's Dictionary, is to deride or to laugh at or to scorn or to scoff. So Ishmael is scorning and laughing at and he's mocking this little boy, Isaac. Ishmael is probably about 14 or 15 at the time, and the little boy is two or three. And he's, he's picking on him. He's, he's mocking him. We see that Ishmael is the aggressor in the situation. This is the history from the two boys standpoint. I Ishmael is the aggressor. Isaac is the one, the recipient of all this um, angst and, and uh, scoffing and scorning. We see that the way the Lord deals with it in, in verse 10 is that wherefore now, Sarah's going to say it first, but the Lord's going to confirm it. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. So the result of the aggression is going to be a casting out. 
And this happened with the child, as is recorded for us in the story. Also what happens in verse 12, And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman, and all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken unto her voice, for in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So there's an aggression, a mocking aggression, and what's going to result from the mocking aggression is Ishmael is going to be cast out. God is going to have him cast out. The mocking is going to lead to Ishmael being cast out. And we saw that in verse 10. He mocks in verse 9. God says, cast him out in verse 10. And then Isaac is going to be called in verse 12. God had made a determination to call him. Now, historically, we see this with the two children. What about the progeny of these two children? After all, Isaac had many children, and then his children had children, and Ishmael had many children, recorded in the Bible, we'll be reading them later on, and his children had children, and they grew to become nations. This scenario of Ishmael mocking Isaac has been going on for 4,000 years. Historically, this has continued. All right, Ishmael continues to attack and scorn and terrorize the progeny and the sons of Isaac. Isaac through Jacob and Jacob's 12 boys and the, and the, the nation Israel and the Jews continue to be attacked. Matter of fact, turn in the Bible to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. All through the Old Testament we, we find it, but I just I was looking around to see where this has, has gone on and with the word mocking, just following that alone. Now in Nehemiah is the is a chapter where the Lord is rebuilding the temple uh, through his people in Jerusalem. And they're rebuilding the temple and they're rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had been uh, torn down by the Babylonians and God is now allowing his people to rebuild. And in chapter 4 and verse 1, Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, but, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, uh, he was wroth and, and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. Now, Who's this uh, San Ballot? Well, look at verse 7. It came to pass that when San Ballot and Tobiah and the Arabians, now these are the Arabians. Now, Ish, the Ishmaelites became the Arabians. The Arabians are, are the descendants of the Ishmaelites. I went to the uh, World Book Encyclopedia to do some research on this, although it is pretty commonly known, but I wanted to make sure that I could get some verification. Now, looking in the, uh, this is volume one of the World Book Encyclopedia. In volume one, it says uh, Arabs. Arabs. An Arab is a person who uses the Arabic language and identifies himself with the Arab culture. Most Arabs are Muslims. Okay, uh, The Arabs and the Jews are the only important Semitic groups who've kept their ancient language. So he says, of the Semitic groups, there seems to be two major divisions, the Arabs and the Jews. Huh. Well, I know which one the Jews are. Which one do you think the Arabs are? Oh, they're right here, Ishmael. As a matter of fact, in volume 10 on page 373 of the World Book Encyclopedia, it says, Ishmael is honored as the ancestor of the Arabs. So the Arabians honor Ishmael as being their ancestor. And what we see all through the scriptures is that the, these descendants continue to persecute and to mock and to scorn God's people, the Jews. And this has been going on for 4,000 years. Uh, this continue, we see Old Testament uh, literature describing this. In the, uh, in the world book, as I was reading through it, what was interesting was, as they looked at the people, and again, we see what, was, what happened to um, Ishmael was he was sent away into the desert region. That's where he was cast out. And in the world book, it says that the, these people live a nomadic life uh, in the deserts of the Arabian Peninsula. That's the very area that Ishmael was sent out to. Uh, they're called nomads and, and Bedouins. They roam with their camels and herds of sheep and goats. Uh, they're organized into tribes where the sheik is the leader. 
Uh, they stay in one place only until they exhaust the pasture, then they strike camp and wander around. Uh, these, uh, it says here, the history of these people uh, before 400 A.D. remains a mystery, except for what we have in the Bible. The reason is uh, literature, they're, they're an illiterate people. L illiteracy remains high in all of the Arab countries. There are 22 of them today, the Arab League, 22 countries. Uh, uh, they're an illiterate people. Uh, it said they, their center of Arab life was Mecca, and it provided a communal action to, uh, to protect trade in the temple of the pagan gods that they had. And then he said the Prophet Muhammad united the divided Arab tribes through the Brotherhood of Islam, and he strengthened their pride in their Arab culture. And from this point forward, then the Islamic people, again, have continued to fight with the Jews. Now, we looked one day... Um, just at the, the lettering here, and we took the word Ishmael, and, and we, we took some key letters out. You get an I from here, you get an S, you get an, an L, and an A, and an M, and there's two letters left over, an H and an E, and, uh, and so it, 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 you know, only in English you can see that right away, Ishmael, he, Islam, and, uh, and so... It's not that hard to figure out. And, of course, they do say, the Arabs do say that Ishmael is their, their father. As a matter of fact, in the Koran here, written by Muhammad, by the time you get to page, I think it was 18 I found it on. Yes. Uh, Surah 2, this is the Koran. Uh, Surah 2, of, of verse 122. My covenant uh, does not apply to evildoers, uh, we made the house a resort, a sanctuary, make the place where Abraham stood a house of worship. We enjoined Abraham and Ishmael to cleanse our house. And then he says, we are the worship, uh, worship your God, the God of your forefathers, Abraham and Ishmael, the one God. So the God of the Koran is the God of Abraham and, and Ishmael. Uh, the Lord here said back in Genesis, that he is the God of Abraham and Isaac, that Ishmael would be cast out. He's not part of the covenant. Two different gods. Two different people, uh, and one is attacking the other. And it shows in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, first reference, who started the aggression? Ishmael. To this day, who continues the aggression? Ishmael. This is from Time Life uh, Library, Library of Nations, a, a book on Israel. And, um, and it's not like Time Life is written by a bunch of conservative uh, Christians. Uh, they're mostly a bunch of liberal secularists. And uh, here they talk about a nation born in strife. Chapter 1, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, uh, May the 14th, 1948, shortly before the onset of the Sabbath, uh, 200 uh, leaders in the Jewish community gathered in Tel Aviv Museum and the establishment of the independent state of Israel was a reality. The newborn nation was born. Twelve hours later, as the sun rose on the Sabbath of the newborn nation, the armies of Syria, Iraq, Transjordan, and Egypt invaded. invaded. Twelve hours after they were born, Arabs and the Ishmaelites invaded. To this day, the aggression continues. Um, 1967, uh, an article, Islamic Arab nations attacked Israel and they said our purpose is to drive them into the sea. The nations that attacked was Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. Uh, this is a perpetual thing that's going on in the scriptures. Matter of fact, in the book of Ezekiel, uh, this is a book that has great prophecy. And toward the end of Ezekiel, we see a lot of prophecy of the end times. And of course, in 37 is the famous chapter with the dry bones. And in chapter 35, uh, he says this in verse 5. The Lord is speaking against um, the Arabs and the, and the Ishmaelites and the Edomites. And um, he says this about them. In, in chapter 35, you can see uh, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it. And these, uh, the, the, Mount Seir is to the east, and it's a little south of the Dead Sea. And that's where Edomites and Ishmaelites, a, a lot of them live. And... Uh, and verse 3 he says, Say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee. I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, and thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. 
God's going to do this. This is what is coming, folks. Uh, the Lord is just getting to wind. He's preparing right now as he's winding all this up, getting ready to finish uh, man's rule on this earth to bring his son back in the next 20 or 30 years. And the Lord's going to bring these prophecies to, to pass literally, just as he brought forth all the prophecies about Jesus Christ's first coming to pass literally, that the prophecies about the second coming will come. And verse 5, he says this, Because thou, you Ishmaelites, you Edomites, thou hast had a perpetual hatred and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword. Uh, I was reading in um, a book by uh, Robert Morey on the Islamic invasion and, uh, and of course also in the Britannica as we saw that the, the, uh, the uh, Muhammad and his uh, followers have spread their religion by the sword, not the sword of the spirit, not a spiritual sword, a physical sword. I mean, I, I, they have the crescent moon and the sword as their emblems, and they're talking about a physical sword. And the Lord says that, you've done it by the force of the sword. And then verse 4, uh, Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Uh, since thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee, and I'll make thee desolate. And of course, the prophecy goes on. But God calls it a perpetual hatred, a perpetual hatred that we see to this day. This fomenting hatred, even recently, I guess, when uh, the president sat down, I think it was President Clinton recently that sat down with um, the leader of the PLO. It looks like Ringo Starr. What's his name again? Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat. Does he look No? Yeah. And anyways, so Yasser Arafat. And, and they were sitting down and they were trying to make a deal over Jerusalem. And, and uh, apparently they offered them even a good portion of Jerusalem and all the land they wanted. And he got it from the table and walked away because the land isn't what he wants. He has a perpetual hatred. Like they said in 67, our, our desire is to drive the Israelites into the sea. And today the hostilities continue with the Arab League. There are 22 nations from North Africa, from Morocco, all the way across to Iran and, and beyond. And, and they have a joint territory that is 614 times the size of Israel. Israel controls point, I think it's 2% of the land. The Arabs have 99.8% of that land. Israel doesn't have 10%. It doesn't have 1%. It has 0.2% of the land. And today Ishmael continues to mock and to scorn and to deride and to hate the Jews, God's people. So the first application we see is historical and we have seen it come to pass. Not only in the history of these two boys, but in the history of the two nations and it continues to this day and they continue to fight and to attack and so the first thing God's setting up for us is showing us that this perpetual hatred will continue until the Prince of Peace comes back and restores that we're not going to fix the Mideast situation that perpetual hatred is inside of them and it started way back here in Genesis 21 and it will continue and God has chosen his side. It's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Does that mean you're out if you're an Ishmaelite? Of course not. Even in the Old Testament, one could be brought into the religion of, of Judaism. One could be a proselyte and to enter in. What about in the New Testament? Well, in the New Testament, there's neither Jew nor Greek. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Just receiving Jesus Christ as a Savior would allow someone to come in. And that's the second thing we want to take a look at here is the doctrinal application. Not only is there a historical application, but there's a doctrinal application to what we're seeing here in this 21st chapter. What's the doctrine? Well, pretty much if you look at it, it's a few things that are contrasted here in this passage. It, it's, it's a picture, Ishmael and, and Isaac are a picture of uh, two different covenants, if you will. Uh, since I got Isaac here, I'll do it on this side. Isaac would represent the new covenant. And Ishmael would represent the old covenant. Isaac would be a picture of, you will, uh, of grace. And I'll show you this in a second. We'll take a look. I Ishmael would be a picture of the law. 
Isaac would be um, a picture of the new priesthood in Jesus Christ. Christ priesthood. And Ishmael is going to be a picture of the old Levitical priesthood. Let me give you some uh, scripture references so we can put this together. Turn to the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. Mark, chapter 10. And you'll see this at work here. We saw historically what happened. Now we see doctrinally what the Lord's painting for us in this picture. It's amazing how God uses real people, has them go through an experience, records the experience, and then, and then shows us beautiful pictures with them. Now here in Mark chapter 10, looking at um, verse, Jesus had been teaching his uh, men. We'll pick it up in verse 32. I love this verse. They were on their way to Jerusalem. And uh, it says, And they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed, they were afraid. This is, does that sound like us folks or what? Is that the Christian life? I mean, think about it. I mean, think about it. We're, we're heading up to the new Jerusalem. You know, who's going before us? Our glorious, beautiful leader. That's a great, you want to preach. That, that's a verse that'll preach. And Jesus is going before you, you see here. And, and how we're amazed. When we see Jesus blazing that, tra that path before us, that path of glory, we're just amazed as we watch it. And not only that, as we follow, we're afraid. <laughs> so can I do that too? He's already made the path plain and clear for you. But, but we're like that. I'm not picking anyone. I'm the same way. <laughs> and I'm the same way. And, and he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto them. And now here he tells them. He says, verse 33, saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem. They're excited, you know. And the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes. And they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles and they shall mock him. Remember the word mocking. And shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and shall kill him. Oh, and the third day he shall rise again. Amen. In other words, they ain't going to get the victory. They're just going to win a little battle. They're going to lose the war. But you know what? They are going to mock and they're going to scourge, and they're going to scoff and scorn and belittle. That's a picture of the Levit Levit Levitical priesthood of Ishmael. Like a, an Ishmael, that's Ishmael. It's the Levitical priesthood when it comes and you compare it to Christ who's like Isaac. And here they are mocking and scorning and deriding and spitting upon the Lord of glory. That's a picture doctrinally of what we see here. For, matter of fact, uh, Mark chapter 15, turn to the 15th chapter. Mark 15. And now, and now the Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he's hanging on the cross at this time. I, I, verse 26 tells you. I mean, uh, verse 25. It was the third hour and they crucified him. And of course, the superscription, the King of the Jews is written there. And then notice verse 29. And they that passed by, they railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and built it in three days, save thyself, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking and among themselves with the scribes. He saved others himself, he cannot save. And there's a picture of the Levitical priesthood mocking Christ's priesthood. Say, I'm getting spiritual, I'm getting allegorical. Well, I got someone that, that taught me this. I didn't pick this up on my own. Turn to Galatians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul taught us these things in Galatians chapter 4. You see, there are spiritual aspects to the Scriptures. There's literal. We saw the literal and the historical. It really happened to those two boys, and it's continued to happen for 4,000 years with the sons of those boys. But there is a spiritual application right here, and Paul wants to give it to you in Galatians chapter 4. And, um, and here's what we say. Now, again, we're, con we're con contrasting it. Uh, let me make it plain for you. If this is Ishmael here, the Old Covenant, the Law, the Levitical Priesthood, this is Isaac here. This is the New Covenant. This is grace. This is Christ and His priesthood. Now, watch what Paul says. He had a bunch of people in this particular region that 
They had gotten saved, and then they wanted to, to be better in their service for Christ, so they wanted to go back under the law. They figured, okay, we'll take both covenants on us. We'll take the new covenant and the old. I'll take the grace, and I'll take the law. I'll have the new priesthood, and I'll get back to do some of the old things. And, and verse 20, it says, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law. <laughs> do you not hear the law? Verse 22, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. Now, who was the bondmaid? The bondmaid was Hagar, right here with Ishmael. Ishmael, Hagar, the bondmaid. She brought forth Ishmael. The free woman, of course, is Sarah. Given the promise, she brought forth Isaac. Now, he tells you, he says, verse 23, He who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. I mean, this is an interesting thing, but you got to see that Ishmael was born by a work of the flesh. It was a scheme of the flesh. I mean, they sat together and they said, well, God says he's going to do such and such and such for us, but he hasn't quite performed it yet. Maybe we'll help him. Let us get involved. Sarah says, yeah, I got a great idea. That nice, pretty young Egyptian uh, bondmaid that we have, she might be able to have that promised child for you. Why don't we do a little work of the flesh and help God along? And so Ishmael is born of the flesh. Now, God is a spirit. He's not going to accept something of the flesh. Verse 24. Here he tells you, which things are an allegory. An allegory is like a, like a parable in nature. It's showing you a physical and a spiritual, and they're going to line up. And that's what God uses. God uses allegories. God uses similitudes when he speaks to his people. He's saying these things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. That's Hagar. See? This would represent the Old Covenant at Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, And the Lord came down in a smoking furnace of judgment upon the mount, and the mount quaked exceedingly, and the smoke went up, and the people heard the trumpet, and they were afraid to hear, and God gave them the Ten Commandments. Anyone saved by those? You better believe you're not saved by those things. Those things will damn you, because nobody can keep them. And if you offend in one point of the law, you've offended in all. And you're guilty before God. And all the world becomes guilty before God. And every mouth is stopped by the Ten Commandments. And that's what this is a picture of here. And then, and then he tells you, that's bondage. Verse 24. See, gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Any doubt who Ishmael is? There it is. It's Arabia. It's the Arabs. He, Islam, Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Right now, the Jerusalem on earth is in bondage to all those Arab nations around her. But that's okay. God's going to make her free. Verse 26, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. In other words, the new Jerusalem, the spiritual Jerusalem, that has been lifted above. That's part of God's kingdom. It's, it's as if spiritually it's been lifted off planet earth and it's hovering above the earth and that's the mother of us all. We all get our birthplace from the new Jerusalem. That's how we're the children of God, by God's work in a spiritual manner through the new Jerusalem. Verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, thou that uh, rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, talking about Sarah, she didn't have a baby, 90 years old. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. God had made a promise to this desolate woman, to this barren woman. He said, you are going to have a child. And that child will have children, and you'll be the mother of thousands of millions through this child. Why? Because Isaac is going to lead not only to the Jewish people, but this is the particular line that's going to lead to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to bring forth a generation of billions of believers, which he's been doing for the last 2,000 years. And that's, and that's all after the promise. We are the children of the promise, just like Isaac, verse 28. We, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise. Verse 29. But, just as then, he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Even so it is now. Even to this day, there's continual persecution of the Ishmaelites 
against the people of Isaac. There's continual persecution of anyone under grace and the new covenant in, in Christ's priesthood to be persecuted from people who are under the old covenant and under the law. And it's not just Jewish people under the law, it's anybody who's under the law. And that, that most of the religions in the world are under the law. Do good, do works, do this, don't do that, don't do this. And you come along, and we come along with the new covenant of grace, and we tell them that it's of Christ, and it's in Christ, and it's 100% Christ, plus nothing, and minus nothing, and they persecute us. And Christians are persecuted for our belief today. The mocking goes on. You believe just because you're born again, you're going to heaven. That's another one of those born again people. Ha, 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 laugh, laugh, laugh. That's the mocking continues. Those born of the spirit are mocked by those who are born of the flesh. The flesh continues to pick on the spirit that goes on. And that's what he's telling you right here. Even so, it is now. End of verse 29. Verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So we see from a doctrinal standpoint what's going on here. The old covenant versus the new covenant. Just like it told us in the book of Hebrews, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for the second covenant and the new covenant. But it wasn't faultless. Because again, God was trying to work with the law through people who are born of the flesh. And the flesh <laughs> in me dwelleth no good thing, Paul says. So God had to come along with the new covenant. What happens when the new birth comes? Well, <laughs> the old covenant continues to mock. And that, that blends us right into the third application, which is the spiritual one. Not just doctrine between two covenants, but the spiritual application is that it's a picture of the flesh lusting against the spirit. This continues to go on to this day. The flesh lusting against the spirit. Matter of fact, you're in Galatians. Turn to the next chapter, chapter 5. And in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse uh, 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. Notice the spirit doesn't lust, but it stands its ground against the flesh. The flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit just holds its ground. It stands against the flesh. It doesn't lust against it. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Again, when we're in the Spirit, we're not under the law. The Spirit is under grace. Right here. The Spirit is not under the law. The flesh is under the law. The Spirit is under grace. We need to be led by grace. We need to walk in the Spirit. We need to walk in grace so that we will not fulfill the lusts and the works of the flesh on an individual basis. Not just doctrinally, do I need to get saved, and that's good, but now what I need spiritually is I need to have a sanctified life, a separated life, moving from salvation to separation. And here is the spiritual application, and we need to stay in the Spirit. Why? Because, verse 19, the works of the flesh are manifest. What are they? Well, they're these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's America, folks. You just named it right there in that, that verse. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Every one of those has to do with immorality. Uncleanness and lasciviousness is the majority of your TV programs and magazine covers. They're lascivious. They're unclean. You can't even look at the things. And what will they lead you to? Well, they'll get you thinking about fornication and adultery. And, and there you go. What are the other things? Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, the people at odds, emulations, you know, up and down, changing their mind and their attitudes, wrath, strife, seditions, that's uprising, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, the revelings of such like, <laughs> of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in the past, 
they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Ishmael. That's a picture of Ishmael. That's the bondwoman. That's the old covenant. That's the law. You know what happens to people that try to obey the law? Eventually they cast the bounds of the law off and they can't take it anymore. They break the shackles of the law and they get right into the flesh and they just go off headlong into the works and the lusts of the flesh. You can only take it for so long. The nature just can't take the law. What do you need? You need grace and you need a new birth and you need a spirit so that you can begin to work righteousness from the inside out. The law from the outside in can't make the change. What we need is, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit is something that grows from the inside. It comes as the water works its way up the trunk into the branches and out into the bud. And the water is working from the inside out into fruit. And the Spirit works inside of us to the out. And it produces love and joy and peace. Not revelings and strife and wrath and sedition. Long-suffering. So when that stuff is going on around you, you can put up with it. And gentleness and goodness. And the fruit of the Spirit is faith. It strengthens your faith as we walk in the Spirit. And meekness and temperance. And you know what? Against such there is no law. And we that are Christ, they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Those are the works of Ishmael. When you see provoking, when you see envying, when you see desire, I mean, Ishmael wanted Isaac's position. I I'm sure he was envious that now Isaac was called. Maybe as Christians, we may get envious at someone who has a calling in their life. If we do... It's coming from this side of us, the Ishmael side. It's coming from the flesh side. You know, the two natures that we have as believers. We have the old man. We have the new man. And these are what pictured for us here. And so the Lord is, is showing us right here in Genesis chapter 21, the divisions going on. Take a look at it, for example, um, in uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. When Paul is out there um, preaching one day. And here he's at Mars Hill, and he's reasoning with the people because they were given over to idolatry. That was the problem with these people here. They, they were given, uh, Acts 17, verse 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. And so then he decides to preach Jesus Christ. And he... And he preaches a brilliant message through here. It's a, it's a blessing to read through and study. And when he was all done, in verse 31, verse 32, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Why is that? Because Paul was preaching grace. Paul was preaching Christ. Paul was preaching the new covenant that's of the Spirit. And the power of that grace and the new covenant and the spirit through Jesus Christ is that God raised them from the dead. And Paul preached the power of that covenant. And guess what? They mocked. They mocked. When the old man hears that stuff, oh, come on. Are you trying to tell me you believe that, that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead? You try to, you, don't you think they carried his body away? Don't you think maybe he never died in the first place? I mean, he's just another man. He's just another martyr if he did die. And we just can't find his bones. I mean, you really believe that kind of stuff? I mean, you really believe he's the Lord of all and that he's the Savior? I don't believe that. That's the flesh mocking when it hears that. And the flesh still scorns and mocks to this day. And, and you hear it over and over. And the amazing thing is I hear it from so-called pastors in pulpits. And they did a survey recently of a number of pastors in this nation. And, and do you believe that there was a literal resurrection? And in one denomination, I, I don't remember which one it was, Methodist, I'm not sure. One of the denominations, 51% of the pastors said they did not believe in the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's wild. What is that? That's the flesh. That's the old priesthood. That's the law. That's the old covenant at work. And they're mocking the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so we see the picture as to what has happened historically between the two boys. We see what's happened to the, to the offspring of the two boys as the nations have fought through the years. We see that God's given us an allegory and a picture of, of the two covenants. And we see spiritually how it applies to our life. And now let me just show you how God's going to finish it. The last thing he's going to do is he tells you this, be not deceived. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. 
Ishmael's mocking. That's Galatians 6, 7 I just read to you. God is not mocked. Be not deceived. Ishmael may mock. The law may mock. The other priesthoods may mock. The flesh may mock, but be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. And there's a day coming, and it's coming soon, folks, when the Prince of Peace is going to return, and the mocking will end. And every eye shall see him, and will behold his glory. And then every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God is not mocked. Cast out the bondwoman. Physically, right now, they get cast out, but the scary thing is someday, spiritually, eternally, they'll be cast out. But our God is long-suffering. The same fruit of the Spirit that he gives to us, he has, which is long-suffering. He has love. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son so that Ishmaelites, Gentiles, Italians, Africans, South Americans, Alaskans, Americans, Iraqis, whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the offer for grace is still open today. We're still under the new covenant. We're still under grace. Christ's priesthood still reigns. He's still operating as priest right now. He did his work as prophet. He's operating as priest. But when he comes back as king, it'll be too late. The door will be shut. And at that time, the, the bondwoman will be cast out with her son once and for all. Turn back to Genesis chapter 21. Joe, how are we doing on time? Um, all right, we can get started on the next. Before I go, any, any questions on the points we were looking at? What's the um, verse for the every knee shall bow? Revelation? No, it's, uh, that, that is in Philippians chapter 2. We wanted to know what verse was in, in uh, every knee shall bow. That's a passage that's in Philippians chapter 2 which talks about the mind of Christ. I'll get the exact reference for you. And uh, 11, Philippians 2, 11. And, and 10, 10 and 11. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and verse 11, and every tongue should confess. Yes? Could Mark also have another meaning when it comes to Scripture? Or is that basically the only time where meaning derogatory or meaning like actually mocked? Well, it, there is, you're thinking of the verse in Proverbs? Well, no, I think... Um, um, he's asking if mocked can mean, have other meanings to it. Well, when, um, in, in Matthew chapter 2, yes. where Herod sent out the wise men, yes. and later on in the chapter they said that um, when he had heard that the wise men mocked him, uh -huh. I'm thinking that's a reference that the heap didn't listen to what he wanted. Yeah, I guess, I guess what they did was they had scorned his advice. I mean, he had given advice as a king, and they had scorned, they had rejected. And Galatians, the, the God is not mocked, that whole context there has to do with communicating, has to do with listening, yes. listening obeying to the, yes. to the voice of God. So to reject uh, someone's advice. So it can be that too. And, I, and think of the, I thought the other reference you were thinking of was in Proverbs, where it said, fools make a mock at sin, and a mockingbird imitates. And so to mock sometimes can be imitate mm -hmm. sin. And that, by the way, that's a curious thing, because Ishmael mocked, and he does kind of imitate. Sometimes you'll see people uh, in that context under the Old Covenant, under the law, under the priest and under the flesh, trying to imitate the things of the Spirit. But predom it's predominant in first reference meaning is that of, of uh, scorning and deriding and, and not paying attention to. Good questions. Amen. All right, back, back to Genesis uh, 21. Genesis 21. So, we saw the test from the family. Now the next, the rest of the chapter goes on. And we saw that uh, they were sent to the wilderness of Paran and took a wife out of the land of Egypt. And now in, in, in verses 22 through 34, what happens is we see uh, another test that comes his way. Um, so we're in verse 22 through 34. Uh, the birth of Isaac, the promise is fulfilled. First comes a test from the family. Now comes a test... We'll call him from his friends <laughs> or neighbors. I don't know what you want to call it, but it's another test is going to come his way. Verse 22, And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, they speak unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. 
Now therefore swear uh, unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. In other words, be kind to me and be kind to my land. Because uh, Abimelech, as we know, was the, the king in that particular region where Abraham had fled the last time. He was the king of Gerar. Uh, that would be in Genesis 20 and verse 2. Abimelech is the king of Gerar, which is an area kind of south and in, in kind of the Arabian area. Okay, and verse 24. And Abraham said, I will swear... And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, Oh, I wot not who hath done this thing. Uh, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet uh, heard I of it, but, but today. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, one of the things that was going on here was we see that Abraham, uh, God had had promised to bless Abraham and to bless those that had a good relationship with him and to curse those that had a bad relationship with him. And, and, and Abimelech had learned from first-hand experience in chapter 20 that when he was doing something wrong to Abraham, God had punished his entire nation. He closed up the wombs of all the women. And then when Abraham prayed for him, God released and opened all the wombs of the women and gave blessing back to Abimelech. And Abimelech had learned his lesson here. And he said, you know, I've learned something here. God's with you. And, and what I need is I need you to, to be a blessing to me. And I want you to be kind to me the way I've been kind to you. Uh, the way he was kind to him was after a little bit of reproof from God. He wasn't initially kind to him. But when God reproved him and said, thou art but a dead man, <laughs> then all of a sudden he was kind to Abraham and he gave him some goods and, uh, and, and let him go free. So now he wants uh, a relationship because he wants to be on God's good side through Abraham. Yet, interestingly, Abimelech's people had been taking away the wells of Abraham. Now, in the scripture, I often think of, of wells as being a type of the source of the living word of God and, and the spirit of God. Now, you can't take the spirit, but you take the word of God from someone and you kind of take the spirit that flows through it. And so, Abimelech here, his people were guilty of trying to take away uh, the wells and spiritually that would be like taking the word of God away. This is one of the great problems we face today. One of the, one of the great things that we face is the world has done everything it can to take the Bible from people. There's been sanction after sanction by popes and there have been decree after decree by kings and people have tried to destroy and keep the word of God from common people. Like we just heard in the victory in Iraq. I just heard today on National Public Radio that they do not want Christians coming into Iraq with Bibles and tracts. They don't want those Samaritan's Purse, those humanitarian Christian organizations coming in. They said, we'll take your clothing, we'll take your food, and we'll take your water, but we don't want that Bible coming in. The servants of Abimelech are trying to keep the wells of water, violently take them away from people who need them over there. And this is a common thing that goes on. Of course, uh, Abimelech then claims when Abraham reproves him, he says, I didn't know about this. And uh, all I can gather from this is that he's a poor overseer. That it's, it's important for, for someone to know, uh, you know the people that you're watching out for. I mean, a pastor is warned to know the uh, state of, of his herd. And, and, uh, and a father should know what his children are doing. And a business owner should know what his employees are doing. And a king ought to know what his subjects are doing. And here he didn't know that. Abimelech is kind of a poor overseer. So, so what's Abraham going to do? Well, here's what he's going to do in verse 27. And now he hears Abimelech and he believes, okay, he's honest. I mean, he reproved me once and I gave him my excuse and he accepted it. I've reproved him. He's given me his excuse. I accepted. And Abimelech took sheep. Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech. And both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, uh, What mean these uh, seven ewe lambs which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, Well, for these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me, that I have digged this well. Now, one of the things he's doing here, I think in this particular test, he's having a little struggle here. Because here's the, 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 you'll find that the enemy comes at us a number of different ways. One of his greatest attempts and attacks, and you'll see this as you read through, especially the book of Isaiah, when you see the battles that King Hezekiah went through. One of the enemy's first attacks is a frontal, a full frontal mocking, scorning attack. And notice, 
Abraham passed that test and he cast it out. And he stood his ground and he pushed it out. Now, the, 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 this is the way that the serpent sometimes wants to come. He, he rears his head as, as a lion, you know, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. He comes as a dragon with his fiery breath and he makes a bold attack on us. And sometimes that is the very attack that will get a Christian to get close to God and stand to God and stand his ground and to hold and to pass the test. Okay, then he says, plan A didn't work. Let me try plan B. And let me try and compromise and make a covenant with him and come in through the back door as his friend and say, hey, remember the relationships we had in the past, how things were going okay from us? And if you thought back on them real carefully, go, well, yeah, it kind of worked out all right, but that was because God intervened. Before that, things weren't working out well. But sometimes we don't think completely and Abraham is going, well, sure, I'll make a covenant. I'll make a covenant with you. And Abraham now in this test, he, he, he could stand against the aggression, but now when the uh, hands of friendly persuasion and deceit and subtlety come, the same way Hezekiah, he stood against the Assyrians, but when the Babylonians came through the back door, oh, we're your friends, we sent the get well card to you. Oh, okay, fine, come on in, I'll show you everything. And it's the same type of thing that's going on here. And, and Abraham is about to make a covenant now, this covenant, is <laughs> he's going to share land with these people. Verse 31, Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they both swear. They swear both of them. And thus they made a covenant at Beersheba. Then Abimelech rose up and fight all the chief captain of his host, and they returned into the land of the Philistines. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba, and, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God, and Abraham sojourned in the Philistines' land many days. Probably not the wisest place for him to be. Probably the better place for him to be was back right where God called him in the first place, between Bethel and Ai, where he set up his tent and he made an altar. But now he's staying in the land of the Philistines, making a covenant with these people. What is happening today? Notice time and time again, just looking in the Mideast, God's people are trying to covenant with the Palestinians. They're trying to get together at Camp David. They're trying to yoke up. They're trying to compromise. What, is it going to work? Oh no, the other side won't compromise. What about with Christians? What about with Christians? How we so desperately love these people and want to get the Word of God to them and we think, okay, I'll put together a humanitarian agency and I will bring food and I'll bring water and I'll bring clothing and I'll bring my Bible too and I'll bring my tracks and we want to make a deal and we're trying to compromise and they say, well, you know, bring the food and the water but keep the Bible out of here. And then I heard today one of the leaders of, of one of the humanitarian agencies says, okay, okay, fine. We won't bring the Bibles. We won't bring the tracts. We're not going to preach. We're, we just want to bring humanitarian aid and let them know that, that we, we love them. And there's the compromise and the devil smiles because we've made a compromise and we've compromised the most important part. What is it? The gospel of Jesus Christ. We've given them the physical and withheld the spiritual. That's no deal. That's no deal at all. It's the spiritual that's the transcendent. The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are unseen are eternal. Our life is but a mist. Life is short. Eternity is long. We need to get the eternal things. And here Abraham shows as he makes the covenant with this man and agrees, okay, we'll stick together. We'll live in the same land. And maybe I'll dig a well. And maybe I'll read a little Bible. But we don't see him making an altar. And we don't see him worshiping. And he compromises just a little bit. And Paul says to us, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I'm ready to preach. I'm a debtor. And so we see the test that comes from the family and he's able to take the devil's full frontal assault because he got close to God. But now here comes the compromise. Let's make a covenant. What does God think about us making a covenant with unbelievers? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? 
Belial is, is the gods of Babylon. Belial is Baal worship. The Babylonian gods. What, what, what concord? What, there's no coming together. What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. Hath God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They will be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. Don't stay in the land of the Philistines. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and my daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And sometimes we've taken a bold stand with our family, and then we've compromised with our neighbors and our friends. What, what Abimelech needed was the witness of the true God. He needed Abraham not to come down to his level, but to lift him up to his level. And that's what they need from us. And, 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 and praise the Lord that, that when the devil comes at us and says, you know, if you don't do this, I'm going to fire you and all that. When your boss comes at you like that and you run to God and you get in your prayer closet and you get strong and you learn to stand for Christ. No, you, you don't strive and you don't fight and you don't argue. You just stand for Christ and God gives you victory. And then the next thing you know, some of your buddies come along and say, hey, we've got a big party going this weekend for the, for the company. You know, we're going to celebrate for the boss. Going to be a big uh, place down at the brew pub. Why don't you come? And then all of a sudden, well, sure, yeah, why not? And you compromise and you go along. And so I can't get you with plan A, but I can get you with plan B. And this is where we have to come out from among them. Say, look, I love the boss. Here's a card. Here's a little gift I got for him. Take it on my behalf. I'll be praying for you guys. And, and there, and it's that test from the neighbors that often the compromise that gets us to fall. And so God puts the picture right there in the scriptures for us. And what do we do? We draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. I'm not sure what's going on. If any man uh, lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth liberally and upbraideth not. He'll show you what's going on there. He'll reveal it to you. He'll give you the strength. Any questions? What we're going to do is, this is a great chapter, but there's one more test to come, and it's in chapter 22. Because three tests are going to follow the fulfillment of the promise. God does things in threes. And in chapter 22, we'll study it next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the teaching here in the Word of God. Thank you for showing us these things, trying to understand the way that we go through tests after we receive the promise. But thank you, Lord, for the promise of Jesus Christ, especially now as we think with uh, the resurrection week approaching. Lord, um, we pray this week that Jesus will be lifted up. Father, and you'll draw all men. Help us to lift up the Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.